Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you for uh, having here having me here. And then um, I look forward to all the exchange that we will have uh, today and then in the next two days. So uh, today, my topic. I was hoping that Valentina is going to give us a definition. Is that like I don't know what we are going to use? Vaccine confidence, acceptance, or hesitancy. But uh, so this is what I will go with. Um, so today uh, I'll be looking at uh, sharing with you our research around vaccine confidence, especially emerging during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and during this period, that as you might already know, that a lot of uh, Happen, things are happening in the artificial intelligence development. And therefore, we are also looking at how uh, in the new context, uh, whether this emerging technology is going to bring in prospects and challenges to our work in vaccine confidence. So this is just a little bit background, uh, who we are. So I'm co-directing with the founding director of Professor Heidi Larson, uh, also at Linden School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, and co-directing with uh, Professor Pia Venden uh, from University of Anthrop. So Vaccine Confidence Project uh, since 2010 uh, established in London uh, at LSHTM. Uh, it has become a global consortium uh, we have three hubs across the globe. Uh, London is our original base, and then we now have an uh, intro base in 2019. And then uh, very quickly, we have an uh, Asia-specific hub, which is based off Hong Kong. Uh, we are uh, a team of interdisciplinary experts uh, in anthropology, uh, digital analytics, epidemiology, policy, and psychology, and more. The group that I'm leading uh, is based off Hong Kong. Um, you will find that uh, a lot of research that we do is associated with infectious disease modeling, statistician, and also uh, AI and uh, behavioral scientist. I myself have a background in communication and behavioral sciences, and then I'm using implementation science to uh, draw on evidence to develop interventions, hoping to prompt change in attitudes and behavior. And then we use the uh, framework to evaluate the effectiveness of this. So this is our research partners uh, across all the continent. And then um, our group has been supported very nicely uh, by, uh, very fortunately, by uh, a network of government agencies, civil society, and private sector. Uh, media and tech company has been our uh, strong partner, especially during the research during COVID and nonprofit and multilateral organizations. So this is what I will go through uh, today. So I will start it off from the research around vaccine hesitancy factors, uh, especially during COVID. How is it different from uh, the previous pandemics? Uh, for example, like 2010 H1N1 pandemic. How is, how is this pandemic so differently from the previous one? Um, and then I'll follow by where artificial intelligence might come into play uh, in terms of its general perceptions around AI what we have learned so far, and then the innovations around uh, AI and how that could address or become a hindering uh, factors of vaccine confidence and acceptance. Uh, finally, I will introduce where we are in terms of how we respond to what we can uh, based on the technology and uh, uh, capability that we have uh, and the direction that we are taking. So this is the definition that came out of SAGE Working Group of Vaccine Hesitancy. Uh, our group uh, was fortunate enough to be part of the member that came up with the definition. Uh, it defines as delays in acceptance or refusal of safe vaccines despite availability of vaccine services. Vaccine hesitancy is a complex and context-specific issue. It varies across time, place, and vaccines. So it is not a behavior. Instead, we look at it more like a spectrum. So people can vary uh, in that spectrum between very highly in confidence to highly hesitant. It could, and the spectrum can vary between vaccines to vaccines. Vaccine decision making uh, from our evidence is not a static state. People can move in and out of it. Uh, it could change over time with different influences and nudges that sometimes prompt hesitancy and sometimes nudge a positive intention to acceptance. So um, 
This is a quick overview of factors and contexts that influence COVID vaccine hesitancy. These factors are dynamic and in con constant interaction with each other, reflecting the complexity of each individual's uh, hesitancy towards vaccines. During the COVID pandemic, uh, some of these factors were more salient than others. Uh, like I said, some of them actually is more salient than others compared to previous pandemic experiences and vaccine rollout. So we found that political affiliation, you will see in the coming up slides, and then distrust in institutions or science, especially uh, the distrust in medical professionals, distrust in scientists and public health professionals and public health institutes. We also found uh, overflux of information and misinformation, uh, which caused the challenge with infodemics that we will be looking at uh, after this slide. So the pandemic highlighted an ongoing loss of trust in institutions and increasing vaccine hesitancy worldwide. Uh, in some of our studies, I wasn't able to present today just because I have too many things I want to say. <laughs> so, but you will find that uh, if after fact, uh, I'd be happy to share the slide, uh, the study that we have. We found that after uh, COVID vaccine, uh, there is a global decline in trust, uh, especially in confidence in vaccine. So misinformation on social media is now shared and engaged with more and more rapidly than real news. It is partially because social media algorithm by nature and by design, it was developed to favor posts that agree with users' worldview, creating echo chambers online to keep you engaged. The effect is that users become less vigilant about fact-checking and isolated among like-minded beliefs in addition, social media efforts to remove or flag misinformation has been somewhat ineffective in decreasing user engagement. So what we have seen is that government, big tech, uh, media uh, institutions, and then uh, health professionals are working to together trying to introduce soft or hard bands around misinformation. However, these efforts um, I can say that I come in the success. Um, so maybe so I think some of the experts will probably echo and share their evidence more. So we see that engagement still increases. Uh, there were two, more than 2,000 uh, COVID-19 related rumors shared just in 2020. Uh, so you could see that on average, more than five per day. Uh, it bounced around between echo chambers among like-minded individuals. So. In this and uh, infodemics, will AI contribute it to it, or will we be able to use it to somehow as a countermeasure? That's what we're going to find out. So, um, uh, I think before I get into more details around AI, uh, I would like to remind that the um, susceptibility to miss or disinformation is not distributed equally. We have found that people of younger age lower socioeconomic status, either lower education, lower income status, or people who experience psychological uh, problems or mental health conditions, uh, in, and also people who are more likely to share or agree with conservative ideologies. These people are more linked to misinformation beliefs during the pandemic, and in turn, these be beliefs influenced their behaviors. Believers in misinformation were less supportive and less satisfied with government restrictions and uh, public health protocols. And, uh, and not surprisingly, they also have lower uh, COVID vaccine uptake. I wanted to also highlight a continued influence effect. So this is uh, belief in misinformation can adversely affect judgments and decision making. The fact that the, the challenging part is, even after corrections are made, this information, uh, misinformation uh, continues to influence people's reasoning. Therefore, presenting factual corrections to misinformation doesn't erase misinformation beliefs. In fact, some evidence show that the original misinformation can remain more influential on thinking than relevant facts. So this highlights a need for us to not only be considering uh, reactive interventions to debunk 
、uh, misinformation to reduce the effects of misinformation. We should also consider preemptive,、uh, a pre-bunking misinformation to prepare people for what is to come. So I'm going to introduce some of the、uh, research that we have done, and then、uh, as mRNA vaccines are the most widely administered COVID-19 vaccine globally, so uh, uh, globally, so it takes up the most market share,、um, and then covering over 160 countries. So this map will show you will see that data from the map、uh, would be uh, quite uh, parallel to the data、uh, to the countries that are being covered by mRNA vaccines. So given the global coverage during the pandemic, we we aim to assess the global sentiment around mRNA treatment technology, and the reason is that given the coverage, we were anticipating. Hopefully, like this will set it up for future vaccines, especially as we know that there will be some、uh, treatments and vaccines being using mRNA technology coming up in the pipeline. So we wanted to know where things are in terms of global sentiment. So we sourced、uh, data from June 2022 last year until May 2023. It's a year's worth of Twitter data, which amount to. About seven fifty thousand Twitter posts. So we label them, analyze them using the WHO three theme、uh, model of of vaccine hesitancy, looking at confidence, complacency, and convenience. We also apply vaccine confidence index, measuring、uh, including uh, perceived tr-、uh, vaccine safety, effectiveness, and importance, and trust.、Uh, Whether it be trusting in authority, trusting in manufacturer or healthcare providers. Finally, we run a general sentiment analysis、uh, that looking at whether people were thinking positively or negatively or neutrally around、uh, mRNA as a technology. So, this is what we found,、uh, which is quite、uh, remind probably remind you of the map that I just showed. Despite vaccine su-、uh, vaccination successes, online sentiment towards mRNA is overwhelmingly negative. Where the arrow that you're looking at, that's zero. So everything below that is negative. So this could indicate a reduced acceptance of future mRNA vaccines and treatments. This is to my surprise,、uh, to the entire team's surprise.、Um, all analyzed countries, so、uh, the countries that was color. Um, were countries that we gather enough data for analysis. Countries that are in gray,、uh, including most of the African countries, uh, where uh, these countries we have not enough data, but at the same time、uh, they also less likely to receive mRNA vaccines during COVID. So, however, if you look at the country that have uh, that have uh, mRNA uh, vaccines during COVID,、um, that has high vaccination rates, like Brazil, Australia. Throughout the Americas, Europe, and Asia, where most countries are over 50 or even 80 percent are fully vaccinated,、uh, the sentiment is negative. So, we take a closer look at what is happening, and we found one、uh, very salient factor, which is political affiliation. Although all average sentiments are negative, we found that in the U.S., for example, negative sentiments towards our mRNA technology is more prevalent in the red states, the Republican majority state,、uh, than in the blue states.、Uh, this is highly significant in terms of、uh, statistical value,、uh, and then、uh, you, and therefore, it is suggesting that trust in mRNA technology could be a partisan issue. That we should look at. We also did an analysis on text-based uh, uh, analysis.、Uh, we found many tweets discussed vaccine side effects,、uh, symptoms that、uh, people experienced after they received the COVID vaccine,、uh, and commonly mentioned on Twitter data. We compare them,、uh, including the pain, cough. And fat,、uh, fatigue, which align with the top three reported symptoms to the official registry, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. We did further digging, 
into topic modeling. So we, in addition to labeling Twitter sentiments, uh, we were looking at recurring uh, text themes and word similarities, resulting in 12 uh, cluster of topics, uh, which is on the right. Top to bottom uh, shows frequency in discussion. So the majority of tweets pertain to hesitancy and conspiracy theories and experimental gene therapy claims. We found that Twitter volume uh, spiked, the discussion around mRNA spiked during December 2022 and January 2003, earlier this year, possibly due to announcement in December where the US and UK and several other countries has approved the use of mRNA vaccines for children, younger children, uh, between age uh, six, six months old and uh, five years of age. Later on, uh, within two months, there was announcement that mRNA technology might be used for pork product uh, and therefore being introduced to food supply in January 2023. These are the most salient words by topic. Um, the word clouds show the most frequently used words within each topic. As you see that some of the topics show a lot of negative words like lie, harm, and death. So I have shown the results uh, to you uh, where adverse events were discussed. Uh, I will give you some examples where um, what the hesitancy discussion is like and um, safety concerns and trust. So this is a conspiracy uh, that we labeled. So uh, these two examples, one from Canada, one from US. In Canada, uh, this, uh, the post-targeting, uh, they use most vulnerable population of pregnant women and then claim that high percent of pregnant women lost their baby due to mRNA. So this is a, pre, uh, a very classic conspiracy theory, uh, uh, fake news that being shared online. Uh, the other one, uh, which is about secret deals broker by Justin Trudeau for stole mRNA. Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada, where I come from, and this post uh, is posted by uh, from a U.S. account, which make it interesting. And so, again, you will see that trusting mRNA technology could be a part political or partisan issue. They, t they typically and very commonly link to authority figures, and sometimes a lot of them are political figures. We also found some discussion around safety issues, mostly uh, sharing common symptoms. Uh, and then that's where we uh, found uh, our data analysis and text analysis on uh, symptoms and adverse events. And this is shows the distrust in big pharma. Um, people, you will see that a lot of the, uh, here, this is an example, and I would like to highlight the tones around it. Um, because you will see later on, emotions matters. Uh, word has feelings, and word can trigger and evoke feelings, and these feelings has impact on behaviors and beliefs. So understanding the link between AI and vaccine hesitancy is crucial, because as we were uh, as we were just looking at, algorithms can amplify misinformation, potentially influencing. Uh, public opinions and hindering vaccine efforts. So uh, this is a quick overview of where we are. Since uh, November 2022, there was a launch, famous launch of uh, ChatGPT by OpenAI, which invigorated public and private interest in large language models and their applications. We found that uh, so uh, you probably have learned that uh, ChatGPT gained a million followers within just five days of its launch. The same record uh, took Instagram 75 days, Spotify 150 days. It, it gained the equity funding, reached nearly $12 billion, and all major tech companies are uh, now developing competing large language models to meet the growing demand worldwide. According to Bloomberg and Goldman Sachs uh, report, they believe that generative AI could increase global GPT by 7% in the next 10 years. What does that mean? So the demand is there, the market is there, and everybody is moving in. So we are going to expect uh, a development, a boost in development in AI, and especially generative AI, in the next coming decade.
and how is that going to affect our research and our work? So, well, as a behavioral scientist, I'm not a computer scientist, so this is my way of simplifying and explaining what artificial intelligence is about. So uh, the ability of computers to process large volumes of data to identify patterns and make decisions. Today, I think we'll be focusing mainly, uh, mostly on deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning algorithm. It allows for brain-like logical structures of algorithms that uh, learn from the data, excelling in tasks like image or speech recognition. So especially I would like to highlight the, the within deep learning, large language models are a type of generative AI that use probability of word order and frequency to parse text-based prompts and generate text outputs. So they learn, it's a form of networks that pre represent statistical frequency and rep uh, rep relationships of words and concept. So popular large language models are trained on hundreds of billions of words and more, and can be provided additional text on specific topics to become highly specialized in certain areas. Therefore, you, we started to see large language models specialized in medicine, in law, and, and in other uh, domains. So generative AI, I wanted to highlight that it's not only creating new contents like text, but also images and music. And therefore, we will be seeing them able to create photos, videos, and songs. So McKinsey released a, uh, state, uh, the State of AI uh, report assessment in 2023. They survey uh, employees that are using generative AI to improve their work, whether it be voluntarily or encouraged by their companies. So we found that Healthcare sectors, pharma, and medical sectors appear to be uh, to have less employees that are using it, whereas big tech and media uh, telecom companies are the early adopters. So, again, why is large language model matters? Why is it relevant to our work? Large language models can be used to study vaccine confidence, acceptance, and hesitancy as they can analyze vast amounts of data to identify patterns, sentiment, and key factors influencing public reluctance, thereby informing targeted uh, intervention strategies and evaluating them. So before I get into what AI can do, uh, let's look at what people think of AI. So uh, there is a recent uh, survey on the public about uh, what what they think uh, in terms of using AI for health, health improvement. The general public is positive about AI's potential to assist with faster diagnosis, reduced wait times, and improve access with remote follow-up. However, they are still hesitant about using fully autonomous AI. There is a strong preference for human provider opinions and oversight. Patients trust physicians' opinions over AI when there is a disagreement. I wonder how you think. Um, then, on the other hand, uh, there are also studies looking at uh, physicians' feelings. Physicians echo uh, patients' preferences for decision-making to be a human task. They don't think that it should be replaced by uh, AI. They, uh, physicians think that AI can assist in daily activities and optimize workflow. However, they are doubtful about the accuracy of diagnosis made by AI. I think, uh, remember this line, because you will see that later on with empirical evidence. Surveying a wide range of medical specialists, uh, specialists found limited experience and te uh, technical knowledge of uh, clinical AI, which may cause physicians to be hesitant to incorporate AI. So, in summary, we have we found that uh, lack of empathy, inaccuracy, and unpredictability are cited among the concerns among physicians of why they are reluctant to use uh, AI in clinical settings. Uh, just a uh, fine print. The data from this study uh, coming mostly from higher and middle income countries, lower income countries, 
uh, lower and middle income countries are undersampled in the study. So, and these are the survey data, and I'm supplemented with uh, uh, online discussion data. Again, it's a large volume of uh, Twitter posts uh, gathered right before the launch of GPT in October 2022 until June 2023. So there were nine months of data being shown here. The results show predominantly positive sentiments toward AI across all eight measures that we use. We were measuring the public sentiment, uh, potent, like agreement in the post on the safety, trust, privacy, usefulness, ethics, importance, quality, and accessibility of AI. Um, although measures of trust uh, and safety are more closely split between agreement and disagreement, people are least confident that AI is safe, but most confident that AI is accessible and easily integrated into daily lives. In general, the acceptance and sentiment about AI is high. And again, let me look at political affiliation again, just as a comparison. Um, here we will see that, oops, sorry. Uh, Democrat states are significantly more positive about AI than uh, the blue, uh, than the red state, the Republican majority states. Again, it's suggesting that political affiliation is re related to acceptance of new technology. So like AI, like mRNA technology. I think this will be important as we form communication strategies. And if anyone was thinking about behavior or or uh, influencing attitudes. These are important factors to be considering. The online conversation about AI primarily revolves around four key themes. Uh, we found that trust, safety, and reliability of content is the most discussed topic, uh, take up about a third of conversation, followed by regulation, ethical considerations, and tech and data security. Within these four themes, discussions can be further categorized into 15 clusters of subtopics. Uh, I understand you probably cannot see it clearly, but then uh, you will see the next slide. The most popular topic is humanity debate. What does that mean? Uh, it discusses AI's alignment with human values and impact on humanity. Although data privacy and concern surpass humanity debates in June 2023, so as you see that during the around the launch of GPT, there was a concern and interest about humanity. How is it performed? And then whether or not uh, AI can behave in, in alignment with human values. However, I think later on, as more and more application being coming available, discussion around uh, data safety, uh, privacy uh, surpasses the discussion about uh, humanity debates. Time trends also show that there is a, a increase, a sharp increase in the number of AI related conversations over time online. So uh, these are the most salient words by topic. As you see that among these 15 topics, one key words that keep coming up, safe, safety, security, uh, it became the most salient words by all topics. And then, uh, and then you can go into the more details into like what they are talking about. Mm, I'll be showing you some examples. Uh, what is humanity debates are? Um, what does it mean when people were thinking about AI and job security? What are the concerns about data privacy and what is human improvement, uh, health improvement? So uh, Twitter users' concerns about humanity of AI echo concerns held by doctors and patients that AI lacks emotional intelligence, empathy, and does not in align with human values. We also see that a concern, uh, uh, a lot of uh, post actually uh, discussion around the concern about job security, AI potentially could replace jobs or dis displace jobs. And there are discussion about how to hit a strike balance between um, AI advancement and then safeguarding individual privacy, uh, privacy rights or preventing mis misuse of personal information. There are also considerations like how a responsible AI system can be built so that it's safe, ethical, and fair. 
and there have been hopes. Uh, people are uh, hopeful that AI could be used for from drug development, vaccine development, disease in, uh, identification, to uh, drug safety, uh, drug safety monitoring, for example, as what I just showed, that uh, it could be used to analyze adverse event data, identify potential risks, and improve pharmacovigilance efforts. So what exactly and how exactly AI perform? Can it do what we think that it could do? So the empirical evidence uh, shown from a systematic review. So this is the work that I'm leading. Uh, hasn't been published, but hopefully coming out soon. Uh, we look at evidence uh, being available uh, from 2010 until today um, on the impact of AI technology on enhancing health, knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors, whether it could be experiments uh, or uh, studies that generate empirical data. After we identify AI technology that has shown to be having effect on health outcomes, we look at how they perform, whether or not they have been a rigorous assessment on its performance, how they were measured, and then uh, and if they compare with uh, human capacity. There were 60 uh, articles that identified uh, during this period. We found that they fall into uh, five categories. Um, AI has strengths in emotional understanding, which is to our surprise. Um, they, it has capacity to detect false statements um, and then have the capacity to diagnostic capabilities. So the number that you see at the bottom is uh, reflecting as, uh, accuracy or success rate. So emotional awareness, it got it 97% of the time correctly. Uh, with misinformation or disinformation detection, we, we found that it has 89% uh, percent, uh, accuracy. It's from some of the studies that you will see in the, in the references. It also has diagnostic precision around 80. So AI does have strengths in these capacity. One thing that has potential gaps uh, on the map is the medical prescribing, where precise medicine administration to appropriate disease AI only got 61% uh, of it. Although keep in mind that the study is limited uh, with a number of study, but then the data is a lot. So we found that comparing AI performance with human, um, there were five studies that are looking at their performance. We found that AI and humans are equally good at recognizing myths or disinformation. AI's Capacity to triage and diagnostic precision is just below human doctors. Um, AI, however, demonstrates stronger emotional awareness, which has a significant value, and uh, outperforms humans in responding to both specialized and general medical queries. In a study uh, which is a blinded comparison of chatbot and verified physician responses to medical inquiries posted online, chatbot responses perform much higher than responses from, um, from medical professionals. So in, in other words, in a blinded study where participants doesn't know where the, com the response comes from, they actually prefer chatbot responses over human responses. Chatbot responses were more detailed and caring than doctor's response, which patients might find more helpful. But remember what we were thinking about perception. The perception was opposite. Chatbot responses significantly more empathetic than uh, human doctor's response. The data, uh, this study was uh, published in JAMA Intern Medicine in 2023, uh, only this year. In another comparison study uh, where AI generated messages and tweets uh, by human uh, for folic, uh, folic acid awareness, and the respondents were coming from university or young adult woman sample. They, uh, between the two groups, both of the groups prefer AI generated messages to human tweets for their clarity and quality. It also, uh, the uh, AI generated messages also slightly higher in reading e score. So the literacy level 
is better、uh, compared to human-generated messages. It also highlighted that in the study, they found AI demonstrated adaptability for health communication in diverse settings, depends on audience, which could be a good tool if we consider health awareness campaign moving forward. So, in summary, while humans are still essential for refining messages, AI has become an asset for rapidly generating creative ideas and. Text for health awareness campaigns. It is found that AI-generated messages rank higher in empathy, quality, clarity, and persuasiveness.、So、there has been successful cases, use cases during COVID,、uh, using to COVID-19 vaccine campaigns. So, just、uh, as a、uh, just a note that these studies did not provide additional training on health topics to the model, meaning that. Existing data available in the public、uh, uh, database has already enough to answer most of the health queries that people might have. So, after looking at all the potentials that AI could use could be used to improve health-related knowledge and behaviors, we should also consider、uh, the dark side. <laughs> so, psychologists. Have established a strong understanding of how people determine truths from falsehood, form beliefs, perceptions, and how they handle corrections. And uh, like I uh, indicated, there was an impact that uh, the corrections might、uh, remain. There might be a remain influence by misinformation even after it's corrected. We found that emotion in provoking content has been found to increase user engagement. With anger as particular feeling, specifically in linked to beliefs and spread of misinformation. In fact, angrier individuals share more COVID nineteen misinformation during the pandemic, and then this effect was particularly pronounced among people who might share a、uh, conservative、uh, ideology. We found that content that with angry words leads to increased sharing, and therefore. Uh, echo from what we learned earlier: in,、uh, words have feelings, people have feelings, and they have power、uh, that will influence beliefs and behaviors. So this is an example where、uh, same technology, chatbot, could be used for、uh, spam and for、uh, a misinformation generation. So,、uh, social spam bots act as human、uh, social media users to circulate misinformation, which、uh, which was a main source of a lot of、uh, low quality information uh, in uh, shared during the COVID pandemic. However, these accounts are characterized by excessive posting to spread false or polarized beliefs. Human users, however, struggle to recognize these automated accounts. They are not human. Uh, only less than twenty-five percent of time that human are able to find out that、uh, they are not interacting with real human. So beyond text, like I said、uh, earlier, that we presented, generative AI now、um, with deepfake technology, they are not only able to create context and texts that are human-like; they are also able to generate photos, voices, and videos. And that have become sophisticated,、uh, well, significantly more sophisticated, lifelike, realistic, and accessible to the general public. AI can make it easier to provoke people's emotion response by creating false but believable visual content that can upset viewers, worsen viewers' attitudes towards public figures, and trust in authority. So,、um, study have shown, unfortunately. That generative AI could create content that appears to be from human sources. Evidence shows that human cannot differentiate between human-authored or AI-generated short text. It's a study that recently uh, published uh, in Scientific Evidence、uh, in 2023. In addition、uh, to creating text that is as human. AI may also surpass humans in disinformation generation. 
they are able to create fake information that is even more deceiving than human created mis disinformation. AI disform disinform us better than we do. So participants successfully identify 92% of human disinformation that is false. That's what we want to. However, their ability to recognize AI disinformation as false was below, which is 89%. The difference has a statistical significance value. We see that uh, in a recent study on GPT, um, we the the positive side is, however, AI also inform humans better. With gains in quality and clarity that discussed in the review that we are shown earlier, uh, participants are able to recognize 84% of true AI information as factual, compared to only 72% of true human-made uh, uh, information. Therefore, the signal is much higher uh, for AI-created messages to make people to believe that the factual information is real. So, as we are looking at um, opposing risks and benefits, we should be uh, considering uh, both sides when regulating AI as we move forward. So where we are in terms of uh, how do we act upon what we learned uh, with the emerging technology becoming available and then where we are taking it in the next step. I think before we get into that, uh, we share that there's a widespread concerns that AI could become too powerful if left unregulated or in the hands of malicious actors. Therefore, um, some, especially in private sectors, organizations are formulating their own guidelines for responsible use of AI through uh, RAI, Responsible AI Framework. These are the uh, texts that are taken from uh, multinational uh, tech services consulting companies and uh, multinational pharmaceutical companies as their, uh, in their update on how they react to the new generation and new era of AI. With these threats that presented, governments are recognizing that oversight cannot be uh, just be implemented by private sectors. Some governments take uh, a more proactive approach, um, ensuring that uh, AI is being uh, accounted for uh, through regulations. And some members of global scientific community have drafted and issued their own framework of ethical development and uses of generative AI. However, undeniably, there are growing opportunities. So sectors predicted uh, by experts that could benefit the most from AI are the IT, communication services, and healthcare and financial uh, sectors. These proposed benefits could be harnessed to address behavior and social drivers of vaccination. We think that it's possible that we'll be looking at educate and motivate the public through content generation and accessible learning modules. Now it become more accessible to uh, to the public. It's also possible that we over, we could overcome vaccine accessibility issues by connecting patients with appointments, or looking at chatbots that could potentially talk patients through their vaccine concerns. So, in fact, COVID nineteen chatbot uh, vaccine chatbots were developed and uh, deployed during the pandemic. It's considered as a real-time conversational tool that could address questions and misinformation with uh, evidence-based responses, if developed properly. Potential advantages over other information sources like scientific articles, as it could, as again, it could be uh, more clear, uh, have higher quality and more human-like uh, conversation with empathy. However, I wanted to, before I introduce what the, some of the studies, I think uh, it's important for us to uh, maintain like vigilant. So monitoring and evaluation around these chatbots intervention were very important, how they were developed, how they, uh, their feasibility, adaptability, and also whether they provide accurate and up-to-date information is very important. 
So here are some of the uh, studies that uh, that, ha that generated empirical uh, evaluation data. One study done in France here uh, shows that brief chatbot usage increased attitudes and intentions toward the COVID-19 vaccines compared to a scientific article. We uh, There were a study, uh, multi-country RCT, that my team runs in Asia. We cover, uh, it's a multi lingual uh, COVID-19 chatbot that being deployed on various platforms, including WhatsApp and Messenger, um, being introduced in uh, Thailand, Singapore, and Hong Kong. However, we found mixed results. So for countries like Thailand, where um, COVID-19 vaccines were being rolled out at that time, co the vaccine chatbot were found to be helpful in sustaining confidence in vaccine effectiveness of, uh, among parents. However, in Hong Kong and Singapore, when the chatbot was being introduced, uh, it was towards the end of vaccine rollout. We are targeting the most hesitant population. Uh, the effect was not there. It was not helpful at all. In fact, when those people, pe the people who have decided to reject vaccine at that time, engage them further with vaccine communication, sometimes have backfire effect. That's uh, as part of our findings. So in terms of next step, what do we do? We are looking at uh, chatbot's impact on uh, a vaccine, uh, HPV vaccination uh, uptake. It is a study that uh, will be rolled out next month. It's a nationwide cluster RCT for uh, for this chatbot uh, across mainland China. The study will aim to evaluate its efficacy in enhancing access to information, addressing hesitancy, and promote vaccine uptake. So this is a design of the chatbot. So you started by choosing who you would like to interact with. They have different uh, personalities, but share actually the knowledge base will be the same. It's just the way of communication will be slightly different. Uh, and we would like to encourage users to have meaningful uh, in exchange before they leave the chatbot. And therefore, we send a reminder to not letting them go before they finish their task. So uh, the next. So uh, here are some of the work that I have shared where we use AI to conduct global social listening, uh, harness the power of uh, uh, text annotation uh, under to understand users' trend um, campaign impact and to detect concerns, misinformation, and adverse event mentions. The next step for it is to inform intervention and in which we are using for the chatbot. So uh, just a reminder that these data set, uh, one is close to 75, uh, 750,000 posts. The other is about a quarter million data set. In the past, a month like this, even with machine learning, it would take about six months to finish the process. Uh, for this exercise, we did it within six, month, uh, six weeks. So uh, for us to run and to employ large language models to semi-automate the coding and analytical evaluation of this amount of data, it is very important that we check and validate the methods. And therefore, we did a manual coding uh, with human coding and then a machine coding uh, with AI. And all measures achieved satisfactory results with high accuracy and F1 scores. That shows the uh, potential where AI can be used for social listening. And data from social listening can be further triangulated with other data source. Like we were sharing that you have survey data, you have in-depth interviews that can be inter uh, lay, uh, triangulated and integrated into uh, the topic that we would like to learn. Uh, we aim to establish a social insight observatory with that's uh, under work and hopefully become available later this year. The platform enables users to interact with analytical results and monitor key issues almost real time, like vaccine concerns, uh, infodemics, adverse events, and disease surveillance. Combining with uh, modeling capacity, statistician uh, uh, modeling, that we think that it is possible for us to now cast uh, vaccine acceptance and vaccine hesitancy as we go. So 
Here are some of the questions that we are hoping to address now and in the near future. So where do we go from here? We think that forming responsible collaborations between AI and humans are important. Um, as we look at the uh, benefits and risks presented by AI, we think that uh, this collaboration is inevitable in the coming years. We also think that effective regulate emerging technology like AI to mitigate risk like misinformation and disinformation will be very critical and we need to act fast. And next, we were thinking that how do we harness the power um, and all the applications that will be coming to at our disposal? I think that improving uh, research and evaluation capacity will be one of them. Uh, it will it allow us to enable, hopefully, almost real-time monitoring evaluation and for us to enable rapid response to the next pandemic or the next disasters. Finally, um, how do we foster trust in responsible AI-enhanced tools? I think it would be quite similar to what we are looking at when a new technology, a new intervention, and new challenges are being introduced. Um, what, is the, what is the risk and how do we form acceptance around it? So that's all for my presentation. Thank you.